Okay, uh, Reb, I want to move on to a, a question that somebody had sent in, and uh, we will open up the phone lines shortly. Uh, just sit tight, and uh, when we do open the phone lines, you'll know I'll have the phone number on your screen, and just be prepared to wait 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, however long it takes for Rabbi to finish uh, answering whatever question he has on his plate at the time. So, okay, this is coming from Timothy Kiger on Facebook. Do you accept the scholarly criticism regarding Isaiah? I mean, Jewish tradition in the Talmud says the school of Hezekiah wrote the book. Scholars say there were two or even three authors. How do I reconcile the tradition with the claims of the scholars? I waited a very long time for someone to ask that question. So the question is, if we look at Jewish sources, so Isaiah, who was a great prophet, who lived roughly 2,500, no, excuse me, 2,700, and let's say he lived a long time. He, he had a he, his prophetic career alone was more than 80 years. So let's say he lived 2,750 years ago. Openly in Jewish sources, Isaiah is the author. There is a caveat that must be said. That is, Isaiah was murdered. He was murdered by his grandson, Manasseh. I'm not going to go into the, all the details, but Isaiah was from the royal family. Manasseh was his grandson. Manasseh was a king, a Davidic king who ruled more than any other, 55 years. He eventually would repent, but he murdered Isaiah. So Isaiah was on the run. He hid in a tree, and Manasseh caught him and killed him. He cut him in half. He died a, a miserable death. The, why is this germane? Normally a prophet would assemble his prophecies at the end of his life. Something similar to the way Moses ultimately wrote the Torah at the very end of his life. That's when they would assemble all their writings and organize it. But given that Yeshayahu Hanovi was murdered. He didn't have the opportunity to assemble what had already been written down. And therefore, Chizkiyahu, who was a great king, in fact, he was such a great king that the Navi says, the prophet tells us, that was no king who lived before Hezekiah or after Hezekiah. Read 2 Kings 18. Who was and no king was greater than Hezekiah before or after. The key is Hezekiah was a very holy man, and Hezekiah and his company were responsible for assembling the book of Isaiah. Hezekiah, of course, was a contemporary of Isaiah. Uh, Hezekiah and his company were not only responsible for assembling the book of Isaiah because the prophet died, was murdered, therefore he died prematurely. Isaiah didn't have a chance to do it. But Hezekiah was also responsible for assembling many proverbs of King Solomon. You'll see that in Proverbs chapter 25 verse 1. We'll just say that Isaiah was written by Isaiah and Hezekiah assembled it all together. Hezekiah and his company. The, the source of that, many sources for it. Uh, we'll just say Tractate Bhavavasra uh, 16. Okay, now let's move on. Modern critical scholars, we're told, they will tell you, they'll jump up and down that Isaiah was not written by one author, but it was written by two authors or perhaps three authors. In fact, everything from Isaiah 1 to Isaiah 39, they claim, they argue, was written by the original Isaiah, the original prophet, meaning dating back, as I mentioned earlier, roughly 2,750 years ago. And then there was another order, author, who wrote from Nachmu Nachmu Ami from Isaiah 40 verse 1 all the way through Isaiah 56 and then they'll either say, even say that that's a Dutro, meaning second Isaiah and he lived during the Babylonian exile or during the Babylonian empire and then there's even the Trito Isaiah there's a third Isaiah, many argue many of these so-called scholars claim who wrote from 57 all the way through 66 okay, got it? Now, people say, oh, the consensus of scholars say that Isaiah wasn't written by one author. This is all complete nonsense. And in fact, the people who make such a claim are the fringe of so-called scholarship. And I say fringe, you go, what do you mean? I can go to any university in the world, unless you go to Yeshiva University, unless you go to a religious school, or I will, I will give a nod to the Christian universities if you go to... Uh, Moody Bible Institute, um, 
they will tell you that's nonsense as well. But the point is, the people who know Isaiah called backwards and forwards in Hebrew, in Lashon HaKadish, and studied constantly, whether you're in Hev Hebron, you're in Eili, you're in Shiloh, you're in Jerusalem, they know Isaiah backwards and forwards better than any of the guys teaching at Harvard. They'll all tell you it was written by one author. Listen very carefully. There are two kinds of academic scholars. There are those who are honest and those who are dishonest. I remember quite a number of, that was that long ago, I'm guessing, I don't know, six, seven years ago, I was lecturing in England, I don't recall the university, it was a, a, a conference of many of biblical scholars from around the world um, who gathered for a conference where people, thousands of people would attend. Thousands. And I've done this in different types of Leemwood, Cage, all these different conferences over the years. And you're a speaker. You're one of the invited guests, you know, to speak. And let's say I will do, over the course of three, four days, I'll do three, four presentations. All right? So they bring me to wherever it's being held. And then I do three, but the whole day from morning to night they have scholars teaching so when i'm not lecturing when i'm not the presenter there are other presenters and many of them are of course the biblical scholars from all kinds of universities i'll never forget there was one woman she's a professor at cambridge of biblical studies and on and she was giving a lecture on the book of isaiah now i wasn't doing anything why because i already gave my lecture before and i was curious to see how she would present it how does this so-called, this scholar with who knows how many PhDs, how would she present it? And I was, now of course I was very familiar with this whole business, but I was very curious to see what would she say? What would she do? So it, I have to say that she was honest. She, during her, pre, in the early, in her introduction to the book of Isaiah, she said, we believe that Isaiah was written by three authors, as I mentioned a moment ago. But she said, why do we believe that Isaiah wasn't all written by Isaiah who lived 2,750 years ago? And the reason is, and she was right, honest, meaning she was being, she was being forthcoming. And she said, the reason is very simple, because of, Isaiah 45 verse 1. Isaiah identifies Cyrus, Kairish, who is the first king of the Persian Empire. There was a, a father-in-law between the Babylonian Empire and him, but we'll just say there was Cyrus the Great. And Isaiah openly identifies Cyrus. If you start reading from 40, Isaiah 44, 28. 45.1, you can go further, 45.13. In fact, 45 is, to, in one measure or another, devoted to him. It's beyond the scope of the question. But the point is, she, will, she said, we can't accept the fact that Isaiah was writing 2,700 years ago, that he should know about Cyrus, who was going to, didn't live yet, who was going to live not nearly two centuries later. And in the academic world, a priori, they come with their intellectual and emotional and all kinds of baggage. They a priori do not believe that this is a holy book. It's an unbelievable thing. Even though the book is said to be holy, they, and they're the scholars of it, their lives are dedicated to show that it's not holy. And they cannot accept that this is the word of Hashem. So therefore, what they do is they reverse engineer it. It can't be that Isaiah, who lived during the Assyrian Empire, Assyrian, not Syria, Assyrian Empire, how could he possibly know about the about the 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 ascendancy of the Persian Empire and the destruction of the Babylonian Empire? It's not possible. We don't believe a priori that God had anything to do with it. And Isaiah was just a, a nice old man who, would, who had incredible you know, Hebrew and he gives us insight into the way Jews thought. But no one who lived 200 years ago could possibly know about, uh, about no one 200 years ago could possibly know about, I don't know who, about George W. Bush, about the fall of the Soviet Union. It couldn't be. No one 300 years ago, or no one in the time of George Washington, could have known about the Russian Revolution. 
and uh, and the fall of the Soviet Union, right? So it must be we find something written about it. It must have been after the fact. Now there are some scholars who are not so honest who go say, "Oh, we have all kinds of calculations of why this is the case." Nonsense. Now it's true that in Isaiah forty verse one, we it, it launch, the text launches comfort. Nachmu, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, declares the Lord. Nachmu, 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 ami. Be comfort. Why? You go to verse 2, for Jerusalem has taken from the Lord double for iniquity. It's true it begins with a comfort, so there is certainly a, a turn after Hezekiah's sickness. But it's like any holy book that will turn, not Lahabdul, Elif Alfi Abdullahs. You can have other books that are, are biographies or histories that will now go, okay, let's go look over here. But in truth, you have the same thing everywhere. Isaiah chapter 1 is talking, it describes a, Isaiah is, cat, is, is, is castigating the Jewish people, and Isaiah chapter 2, which everybody admits is the same author, starts talking about of the coming of the Messiah, and about that out of Zion will go forth the Torah, and nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. That means this is the nature of the prophet. It's always shifting from one to the other. Now, why everything is juxtaposed? This requires some scholarship. So I, so I want to say that these scholars are simply reverse engineering it, and they, well, they have no, they, they call them, I call them scholars, PhDs, but these, these are not scholars, they're just reverse engineering it. They a priori walk in and say that they don't believe that God gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, and they don't believe that God actually spoke to Isaiah. Or the more honest one will say is we in the academic world don't have the tools, it's simply we don't have the tools to examine such a claim, and therefore we have to explore this ancient document, namely the Jewish Bible, using the same methodology that they would be studying Cicero, Cicero's Republic, or any book from the ancient world. But you can't do that, because the, the Tanakh claims to be the Word of God, and Cicero's Republic, all six volumes, doesn't claim to be the Word of God. You therefore do not have the tools to examine it. They actually say this as fact, and this is what's really wrong about it. They want to say is, based on our system of what we can understand, and based on the tools we could use in a secular academic world and the science of studying ancient works, we have to conclude that someone else must have written it. Why? Not because there's big fat evidence anywhere, but because we're stuck. We can't go and say that it was written afterwards. Now, we can't say it was written before that Isaiah could have known about Cyrus. That's not possible for them. But what they should say is we're not qualified. I mean, I wouldn't have my doctor who does root canals deliver my grandchildren. I just He's a doctor, it's true. He studied, it's true. But he wouldn't have a dentist deliver babies. That's all. They just, that's it. Is there something in common? Yes. Well, you're just not qualified to make such a determination if you don't have those tools, which they all say. We, in studying history, don't have those kinds of tools. Now, one other point which illustrates how foolish this is. That is that, as it turns out, they argue that Isaiah... 1 through 39 is written, authored by the original Isaiah, and it's only the later books that were written by later men who then claimed to be Isaiah but weren't. That means they're forgeries. Or, and then they were slapped together. Okay? But the problem they have is, and no student at the university could push back, I'll explain that in a moment, is that Isaiah 13 and 14, particularly chapter 14, Isaiah is describing the downfall of the Babylonian Empire. Not kidding, of the Babylonian kings. That means Isaiah addresses Babylonian kings and, and talks about their haughtiness and how they're going to come down. Now, what that means Isaiah is addressing the Babylonian Empire. I have news for everybody, my friends. Isaiah lived long before there was anybody ever heard of a Babylonian Empire because it didn't exist yet. So when you when you say something that's not true, you're going to get in a lot, a lot of trouble and you look like a big idiot, and that's what I said, to people who are, no, who are knowledgeable. Now granted, you have a young student who goes to Yale, 
Yale and he's taking a course in Old Testament and he goes to Harvard, he takes courses in Old Testament. He doesn't know he doesn't know this. They don't study Yeshayahu. That means they come in, of course they know a few things here and there. They don't they're not conversant in it, so they can't push back. So but if someone would say to the press, hold on here with your big claim that Isaiah didn't write Isaiah because it didn't write Isaiah uh, 40 through 66. Why? Because there's something in 45 which is speaking about the future. Now, if he's a prophet, it's not a problem. A prophet means that Kodesh Baruch, the Holy One, blessed be his name, informed Isaiah that, the, that there will be such a, a man who will rise up. And this is a source of comfort, and Isaiah warns us, don't question why I'm doing it. Just want to give you the context of Isaiah 45, verse, verse 4, for instance, where Isaiah says, it's a man who does not, is someone who does not know my name, and Isaiah 45 continues in, don't question my way. Sometimes you see things and you don't understand why. Why would you pick a pagan like, like Cyrus? Cyrus was likely a Zoroastrian. Okay? Why would you pick him? Why would you pick the chief rabbi? God says, don't question why I do things. But the key point is, is that students who sit in a university classroom and they hear this kind of academic drivel, they can't push back because they don't have what it takes to push back. One other note that I have to say, and I'm not going to reveal names, but there are many professors who have a religious bent, which means they're knowledgeable. They're not idiots. And they tell me straight away, personally, between us, they'll say to me, Rabbi Singer, if I would write an article, if I would teach in class or publish a book that said that Isaiah meaning who lived 2,750 years ago, wrote all the book of Isaiah, if I would, I would never get published in a journal and I would never get tenure and I'd get thrown out of my head. That means this academic world, although it, it, they claim, well, we're open to all ideas, are, this baloney, they're all a bunch of fundamentalist atheists, and if you dare try to violate that world, and if you dare try to go up against it, you find yourself that you're in North Korea, and they will throw you out on your head, and you'll never get anywhere, you won't get tenure, you won't get hired, if you ever publish that. The same thing goes for Daniel. Daniel, very clearly, in the last three chapters, particularly 10 and 11, it describes the, the Greek Empire, uh, the death of Alexander the Great, the four kingdoms that emerged following Alexander the Great in the Greek Empire. How could Daniel, who lived during the Babylonian exile, have possibly known about uh, the Persian Empire? I mean, he lived in the Babylonian Empire. How could he know about what was going on in the Greek Empire? He couldn't. It must be Mucher Leimer. Daniel later. They do the same thing. Why? Because they can't accept the terrorists from Hashem. So they say that Daniel lived during the time of Maccabees. That's what they say. And I, I say this to you, listen carefully. If you read books that you if you read books written by the academic, biblical academic world, that so called, they're all gonna say that. If if you've read these books, you know what I'm I'm not I'm not setting up a straw man and toppling. You know that they all say this, that the book of Daniel was actually written during the time of the Greek Empire, but, and he didn't really live during the Babylonian Empire. They say it. And I'm going to challenge you on this. I don't know the percentage, but I'm going to make this up. Somewhere about 98 to 99 percent of those books who make that claim is a fantastic claim that the, the book of Daniel is a forgery, as in the second half of Isaiah, and they don't give any support for it. Did you notice that? I'm not going to. I don't want to embarrass people. I don't want to. Ta I'm not interested in it. You know, and I know that when you read these books about the Bible, they go and whatever words they use, they'll go, of course, everybody knows that Daniel, or they just go, Daniel was actually written during, you know, uh, 2200 years ago. Ah, Daniel was the viceroy of Babylon 2500 years ago. It's not true. It's a fake. The whole thing, that's a forgery. He wrote it, Daniel wrote it as though he lived 2500 years ago. They say that. And if you read biblical works, 99% of the time, it's so rare that there's an exception to this, they'll just simply say it. We know that it's true. Do you know what kind of claim that is? I, I need to say this because no one's talking about this, and, and, and I'm not some sort of genius. I mean, this is so... 
like, where's your support for this? Now you go, the, the support for this is so thin, it's stunning. In order, first of all, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls, which go date back 22, 23, first, second to third century BC, is loaded with the Book of Daniel. The people who lived in Qumran, the uh, probably the people who we believe are the Essenes, there's loads of books of, of the Book of Daniel as scripture. They knew it was scripture, and that's they lived in the same time. They love Daniel because they love a, the kind of apocalyptic prophecy, and Daniel fits right in there, particularly uh, the last, for, last six chapters. They love Daniel. Why do they consider it scripture? If Daniel was one of them, they would know right away to forgery. Number two, what, what the Jew, Daniel rose to be the viceroy of Babylon, vice president of the United States of America. A Jew, not just any Jew, a great rabbi, not just any rabbi, he was a prophet. He was, not only that, he was from the royal line of David. This was a person who came from Judah. He was of the most elite, not that he, he was an amazing person, he just was born to such a family and he was, and everybody knew this is the Babylonian Empire. This is not Luxembourg. This is not the Bahamas. This is not, he became the leader of Bermuda, that no one even knows what president or who's there, what kind of country it is. The only people who know is this nice water there. No one knows who leads these countries. This is the Babylonian Empire. That means this is the United States of America. That was it. The Babylonian, the Babylonian Empire that defeated the Assyrian Empire. All the Jews knew, of course, it was one of our prophets that became the viceroy. How do you invent up a history like that? That means you need tremendous evidence, not some thin convoluted evidence which almost no one offers. Moreover, I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to give you a few points because I don't want to overwhelm the viewer. We have a witness to Daniel's status in the Babylonian Empire. Namely, we have a contemporary, and this is very unusual, meaning we have almost nothing from the ancient world. There is almost nothing that survives that's two and a half thousand years old. Very, very little. There's a dearth of, inf of, of literature. It's not like today you could publish in the Amazon. In the ancient world, what do we have? We, had nothing. we have almost nothing that survives. We have little cuneiforms, but very, very little. We, as it turns out, we have something humongous. And that is, we have the book of Ezekiel, the book Yechezkel Hanavi, lived during the Babylonian exile. Moreover, everybody concedes that, that Ezekiel lived 2,500 years ago. Even the academic world concedes that Ezekiel was a, 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 a prophet of the Babylonian exile. Why is not germane why they all have to concede that point? We know where he's buried. He's buried in Iraq, right about four, I think about 45 miles outside of Baghdad. The point is that Ezekiel, a witness in conversation, just he's speaking agavurche, which means he's addressing the king of Tyre. Do you think you're as wise as Daniel? That's what he says. Now, Daniel was known for, his, known for his wisdom. That means we have a witness from the ancient world from, that will live during the Babylonian exile that no one disagrees with Babylonian exile. He's not trying to make a point. He's not trying to prove anything. He wasn't dealing with Harvard University professors. And he just is castigating people going, you think you're as wise as Daniel? Take, take a look at, at, uh, at Ezekiel 14 and so on. So, we have a witness how would you convince the Jewish people if Daniel never existed in the Babylon exile and every, every Jew everywhere in the world, from Yemen to, to Iraq to everywhere, we all knew about Daniel. There's no controversy at all. And they all have to claim that Daniel was written later. Why? The reverse engineering it. So the bottom line is the following. The academic world is a godless world. Now, there are some godly people who teach, who have a good job, and they want to keep their job. And just like in North Korea, if you write the wrong thing, or if you express the wrong thing, you're going to find yourself in a lot of trouble. You're going to find yourself that you're going to become dog food. In the academic world, if you defy it, in, on these, on their fundamentalist thing, believe me, they're the biggest fundamentalists in the world. They make Jews, Muslims, and Christians look like, 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 
like nothing, like liberals from the New York Times. These guys are the real fundamentalists. And if you defy them, you won't get tenured. If you defy them, you will, you will not get a... If you write what I wrote now, you will never get tenured. You'll never get published in the, in the academic journals. It'll never happen. So the answer is, Isaiah wrote all of Isaiah. The academic world sort of portrays itself like it is the... It is fringe. If you go in the Jewish world, in the Torah world, people who study day and night, who know Isaiah backwards and forwards, called in the original Hebrew, which most academic scholars do not. It doesn't mean they can't read Biblical Hebrew. But for them to even write a paragraph in Biblical Hebrew, go over to him, ask him if they can do it, and you're going to be very shocked. They can't touch the guys who are sitting and study this day and night. The answer is, it was written by Isaiah. It was coalesced by Hezekiah. Hezekiah lived, lived during the time of Isaiah. Isaiah died prematurely, and as a result, Hezekiah and his company assembled the book of Isaiah in what we have today. This is all nonsense. This is propaganda. And what is the purpose of it? There's a purpose. The purpose is to deny that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be His name, could inspire prophets that can, that can teach and preach about events that happen in the future. To them, that's not possible. And that's the answer. And study the original, my friends. Go to the Hebrew. When a professors make these claims, ask him, you know, you wrote a book and it says Isaiah was written by multiple authors. You don't offer any proof of that. All you do is you say it was it, it describes Cyrus, but what's your proof? He's a prophet, or he's claiming to be a prophet. You have to show me external sources, and it better be more than Isaiah 40 begins with comfort, because we have that everywhere, that kind of back and forth. Anyways, let it be that the study of the holy works of our prophets of blessed memory will bring the B.S. Goyal HaMashiach, the true Mashiach, quickly in our time. Great question, thank you. אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא ואת נעשה בחפצו כל אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו, ימלוך נורא, והוא היה 